Welcome to the DRF College Sports Podcast, brought to you by DRF Sports. Daily Racing Form, America's most trusted name in horse racing, is now providing sports bettors with exclusive data analytics, previews, videos, and expert picks on all major sports. Bet smarter and have more fun doing it. It's the DRF College Sports Podcast, and now your hosts, Jack Fitzpatrick and Bennett Conlon. Ready, set, bet. Welcome into the DRF College Sports Podcast. My name is Jack Fitzpatrick. I'm joined, as always, by none other than Bennett Conlin. Um, I think I should refer to you as, I don't even know what your overall record is anymore, but losing record Bennett Conlin. Yep, 23 and 25. Uh, doomed, you know, by that one in six week a couple weeks ago. Almost got it back last week. I was 4-0 to start. Ended up five and four. There were a couple of bets that I had set on the show. And like when the day arrived, I was like, that's a loser. Uh, number one would be the Louisville money line against Syracuse. I, I realized after I saw it, I was like, Syracuse is a seven point favorite against a team with like the same record. Seemed a little fishy. And I was on the very wrong side of that. Louisville got absolutely run out of the gym. So disappointing uh overall but i've had a, a bunch of solid weeks you though you on the other hand jack you're 20 and 10 this year which is phenomenal we should start calling you like jack a10 fitzpatrick yeah i i want you because you went back and you re-listened to the best bets portion of each podcast and that's how we did all this very scientific finding we didn't have a special way of doing it so bennett put in the groundwork went back and did that I didn't know I was so good at A10 and like not to toot my own horn, but I guess watching countless hours of A10 the last two years, um, I've picked up a thing or two and maybe my, my love for Richmond isn't unrequited. Yeah. It's been really good recently too. It feels like you've been kind of on, on some of those accurately uh, in, you know, recently uh, pretty good, pretty good been major stuff from you. You've been solid. i just overall though. I mean, 20 and 10 is, is very good. The one thing I will say, and I think we got to hold ourselves accountable here, we have to be very clear of like, these are our best bets. Cause it was like, we would say best bets and then we'd be like, kind of like this, but wouldn't be clear at a few times of like, really, when it was actually a bet. So I went back and used my best judgment, but there were a couple there where it was like, I would hear myself talking. I was like, yeah, I didn't mean to <laughs> say what I said there. Or like, that wasn't a best bet, but it, it could have been if you were listening like a little unclear. So I think that's a good one for us to remember. Like, hey, this is actually a bet we're placing. Yeah, that's actually really – you went back, you watched the tape, you learned where our flaws yeah. were, where our weaknesses were. You, you used it as learning experiences, and, and now we can take it forward, moving, attacking, especially going into March Madness. Um, I'm really looking forward to March Madness. I think we're going to hand out a lot of winners. I think we're going to have really good insight because when, when there's that much college basketball – I think, I think we can give not only with DRF Sports' exclusive betting trends and data and analytics and everything like that. From a mid-major perspective, there's not a lot of great mid-major voices. And I'm not out here, you know, patting ourselves on the back for a podcast that gets 20 listens an episode and is slowly growing. Like, by no means are we the end-all, be-all. But I feel like both of us know what we're talking about when it comes to mid-major. And we might be able to, you know, fish out a couple solid – underdog money line winners especially in that first weekend yeah absolutely i also feel like a lot of the like mid-major coverage is coverage and not necessarily betting analysis you got some of it for sure three men weave does a nice job too but yeah um yeah it's it's hard to find some of those and if you watch a bunch of mid-major basketball you probably have a little bit of an edge just because it, it feels like you know the majority of the public and some of those lines are kind of focused on where you're going to have a lot of the handle and understandably like a jmu Charleston January 24th game is not going to have a, a large handle on like the total. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. And with all that being said, before we dive into anything further, we got to let you guys know that DRF cash grab is DRFs. It's not, it's not all new anymore. It's been around for a while, but it's our free to play sports prediction app available on iOS and Google play. You go in, you predict some things about some, some, some football games, some basketball games, some soccer, so really almost any sport under the sun. You go in, you predict some stuff. If you get it right, you win real money paid out at the end of every day. You'll get real money. So go ahead, go, in, go to the iOS, Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, and download the free to play, free to play DRF Cash Grab app. Boost your bankroll. Get going. It's going to be fun. I did that off the top of my dome. 
probably shouldn't have. I probably should have read the script that I wrote out for that specifically, but here we are. Now, do we want to talk about low thrill scores first? We can do or, that, yeah. Or do we want to start with college coach draft? I think the coaches are too fun. You want to just roll through the thrill score real fast? Get are them you out saying of the way. low thrill score is not fun? Yeah, let's roll through low thrill score, and then we'll dive into – Good, good idea. We'll tease it. We'll tease it along. We'll do low, low throw score. And then the most important thing is the college basketball draft, college basketball coach draft. All right. Thursday, February 10th, IUPI at Purdue Fort Wayne. Yeah, IUPI, the worst team in college basketball. They're 1 in 19. If I'm not mistaken, Jack, they put out a tweet this week uh, asking like students if they wanted to try out. Not even kidding. Uh, they don't have. Don't have a D1 win. I believe they're looking for students to play. Oh, I feel bad for them. Yeah, that's not ideal. I think they've had some some tough injury luck too. Uh, I don't, not a great spot, but I do want to lay 20 points with Purdue Fort Wayne. No, I don't. Okay. All right. So we're taking the uh, the boys from IUPUI, worst worst team in the country. Looking for some students. I think that November 23rd win, 20 point win over Spalding. Maybe the momentum carries over from that one, even though there's been about 15 losses in between. Um, and yeah, I hope for the best. They've had a couple close calls. They've also gotten blown out a good bit, but they've had a couple close calls. And, and recently, they've gone three consecutive games without losing by 20 points. So are they hot? The boys at IUPUI hot? <laughs> I don't know. Let's move on to Friday. <laughs> Uh, this is a really good one. No, actually, we can't do that one. Yeah, it was a, a, I was. I really wanted to go into hear your side on Northern New Mexico against New Mexico, but no line on that one. So instead, we'll do Ryder at St. Peter's. <clears throat> St. Peter's is favored by nine. Don't look now, but Ryder has won three consecutive games. You know what's insane? There's a lot of schools out there that haven't done that in years. Years, <laughs> but they're playing pretty well. Although St. Peter's is actually not a horrible team, and they're at home nine points. I, I do think I kind of like St. Peter's in that spot. All right, you like St. Peter's at minus nine. I can get behind that one. Not really. I'm not betting any of these, but you know, low thrill score. Let's ride it out. <laughs> Guess who's back? My back boys. Again. <laughs> IUPUI is back. Tell a friend. IUPUI at Cleveland State. Cleveland State's favored by 24. Yeah, Are you this one I like. IUPI again? No, this one I like Cleveland State. They've shown up a few times because they're in an absolutely dreadful conference, the Horizon League, but they actually have an okay team. Uh, Deshaun Parker, a boy from JMU, defensive dynamo, is um, he's on the team. He's on, on a, a team that could make the tournament and be a 16 seed probably. So, I think that would be consecutive years for him. It's a 16 seed, actually, but happen, which would be kind of interesting. Uh, but anyway, nobody cares about that. I'll take uh, I'll take Cleveland State. All right, Cleveland State minus 24. I like it. Sunday. Oh, oh a little America East showdown between Stony Brook and Maine, two CAA football schools. Do you think that bad blood boils over into basketball, where Stony Brook, the road team, <laughs> is favored by nine? I think Stony Brook, they've lost three in a row. I wonder how, how demoralizing it was. They recently learned that they were kind of getting the CAA treatment. Um, they're moving conferences, right? So the basketball team this year is getting banned from the postseason tournament, which is really frustrating for them. Uh, the American East is, it is what it is. Vermont seems pretty clearly like the best team yeah. in the conference. But I don't know if you're Stony Brook, you've had some good history there. It's probably really disappointing. I think they'll find a way to rally, though. They're playing a horrible main team. I think they'll try to finish strong and, and it kind of starts with that main game. So we'll take that with their minus nine. I would take that. All right. I respect that. I respect that. So you got IUPUI at plus 20 when they go to Purdue Fort Wayne, <laughs> you got right. You got St. Peter's minus nine at home against Ryder. You have Cleveland state minus 24 at home against IUPUI. And you have Stony Brook minus nine on the road at Maine. This is correct. I haven't really tracked those. So I don't know how those are going. I've tracked the last two. I didn't. I've, I have it written down. I haven't gone back and, and figured it out. Um, you went two and two two weeks ago. 
That's uh, great. And then I'll, I'll figure out the, what you did last week and, and, and let you know, and we'll talk about it next week. I, I meant to track it before we, before we jumped into this one, but I did not. So. All right. You ready for the best part of the show? I've, I've actually been really looking forward to this since, was it last night we talked about it or this morning? I think it was, it was last night or no, I think it might've been, it might've been Tuesday morning or, or maybe even Monday. What sparked this is I used to be on the UVA beat. So still kind of plugged in with what UVA is doing in the college basketball world, but also like UVA fans who all, you know, Virginia went to Duke in one, I think they're like plus 500 ish on the money line, depending yeah. on which book you're using. They go, they win. Reese Beekman had essentially a buzzer beater. I think there's probably 0. 0.7 seconds or a second left once it went through, but essentially a buzzer beater. They win, they beat Duke on the road, and people are going, Tony Bennett, he's the best coach in all of college basketball. Uh, uh, Virginia fans were saying they played a walk-on for 14 minutes, ignoring the fact that, of course, Tony Bennett has recruited this roster, which <laughs> needs to play a walk-on for 14 minutes. But anyway, best coach in America, never forget it. Um, they're still on the outside of the NCAA tournament picture, but we don't care about that, Jack. They just beat Duke. That's all that matters, even though it was a huge letdown spot. But anyway, the point was, I think there is a legitimately fun debate about who's the best coach in college basketball. And I'll let you set the stage for, for how we're maybe going to analyze this. Cause I do think the criteria of like best coach is pretty important. Yeah. So we're not, when we do this draft, we're doing a top 10 rotating between Bennett and I. So we both pick five coaches that'll, that'll do the top 10 best coaches in a college basketball draft. But the criteria is very important. We're not picking right now who's the best coach. We're not saying Coach K is the best coach. We're not saying resume-wise Jim boeheim has been around since the dawn of the new of the 19th century and he's the best coach. We're saying if you have a draft, you've started a new program, and every single 358 Division I men's basketball head coaches are available to be drafted, who are you picking to start your program with. So there's a couple things that are going to be factored in. How has, you know, a coach been able to build a program? At least this is what I'm using as criteria. Ben, it might be different. We both have different big boards. It'll be interesting to see how we kind of differ, but kind of how have they been able to build a program? What's their kind of longevity, but not necessarily coach K longevity. What is their age? How many years left do you think they have in them? So a lot of different things. And so it's not who's the best coach. It's not who has the best resume of all time. It's you're starting a program. It's a draft. Who do you got? So I flipped a coin earlier today. You got first pick. So why don't you, uh, you get this thing? I'm going. glad that uh, I'm glad that you gave that to me. Cause if you had said that you flipped a, co a coin earlier today and you had the first pick, I would have been a little bit stunned there. I would have, you know, maybe been a little flustered. Well, I think our first picks are going to differ. So Bennett, I, Conlon, yeah. what's your program name? First, what's your program name? <laughs> I didn't know we had to name our, <laughs> our program. Um, the Bennett Conlin Institute of Technology, but we're going to be just a strictly a journalism school. All right, so, so BCIT, BCIT, but it's just journalism that we're teaching. Perfect. So BCIT, and, uh, you're now on the clock. Okay, so I think the thing for me is age plays a pretty tremendous factor here. I was looking for someone that probably could give me a decade or so. So like Coach K, you're out because you've got like two months left, right? <laughs> As a coach, because he's going to retire. So like that that kind of stuff, it takes some of those guys. You mentioned Bayheim. I don't know that I want Bayheim anyway. We're not running a 2-3. We're not running a goddamn two three zone so that takes him out but there's still a lot of really good coaches even even that i think like a rick patino and a tom Izzo. you're looking at 69 years old 67 years old i did not disqualify them because i think that they could give you five plus years which is you know build a solid foundation for your guys for the bcit um so first pick i'm gonna go mark few go Ooh. mark few gonzaga head coach he's 59 years old you look at his resume, and, and this was some of the debate too, is there was another Gonzaga take from like a bracketologist out there, one of the, the many ones. I think he's got like, you know, 5,000 Twitter followers or whatever. But he, he tweets out uh, that Gonzaga hasn't won national titles uh, in part because they're not battle-tested in conference play. I'm glad that we're this close to Mark Madness where these takes are getting recycled. This is a, a sign that the tournament is close, uh, but a horrible take that doesn't make any sense. People are like, well, it's not even a take. You know, it's, it's kind of true. It's like, no, it's not. 
it doesn't make any sense. Like they've been one of the best teams in college basketball. They played in two national championships since the 2016, 2017 season. And they would have had a team that was probably gearing up to make a legitimate run at the national title uh, in 2020, 2021, when COVID ended that season. So I don't know. I have a hard time understanding that argument about Gonzaga not being good, but he took over as the head coach for the 1999, 2000 season. They made the NCAA tournament every single year. Um, and they were kind of building the program where the, some of the win totals were inflated early on in part because of the conference competition. Like I get it, but they were really good, made the tournament every year. There was some round of 32s, a couple sweet 16s mixed in there. Some, some first round exits for sure. Totally get that. They didn't make an elite eight until the 2014, 15 season. But since then, the worst they've done is a Sweet 16. They've had two runner-up finishes. They had a team last year that nearly ran the table the entire year. It was unbelievable. We're blowing teams out. Like Mark Few is a tremendous basketball coach. He's achieved a ton there. I mean, you can look and, and maybe say he had the, you know, the DUI this year where he was suspended a few games or something, I guess, if you want to factor in like the classiness of the person leading your program or whatever. But like aside from that, he seems like he's got a pretty good history he wins a lot of games he also another thing is like he's grown from getting some maybe unheralded guys and, and turning them into really good players to getting like the best recruits in the country some of the best transfers too and I think that that certainly matters so if I'm starting a program I think Mark Few at 59 years old you're getting probably at least a good decade out of him it makes a lot of sense to me all right I really like that breakdown and this whole time you've been talking I've gone through I'm on my, I think I got my the second overall pick for Fitzpatrick University. F you. <laughs> Very good. I like that. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to show my hand on who my other picks were. Okay. Uh, because they might still come up. Number two overall pick. I'm on the clock. Like you said, I'm factoring in age. I'm factoring in have they been able to keep their program near the top of the top of the you know top of division one for a while what do they do it with um are they able to do it with fantastic recruits like mark few and are they able to you know build a program from kind of nothing and and create these fantastic players with the second overall pick fu is taking jay wright villanova yeah. head coach 60 years old i think he has another 10 15 years in him he's been fantastic he's been team usa head coach He's 630 and 280 all time, has a darn good record in the tournament at 30 and 14, 24 and 15 in the Big East tournament. He's never let Villanova fall underneath 30 in Ken Palm outside of his first three years when he was building that program. And that 30 year was in 2019. I believe that's coming off of the national championship in 2018. And then what he did at Hofstra before he even got to Villanova in 2002, 1997 to 2001, took Hofstra from a low 100 Ken Palm team to a top 75 Ken Palm team. Really like what he did, and not to mention who he's coached. I mean, he's coached DiVincenzo, uh, Ar Archie Diakadu. I completely mispronounced his name. Um, <laughs> Kyle Lowry. I mean, who he's been able to recruit to Villanova, and then also the fact that not big names he's been able to recruit to Villanova and then create a team that is consistently a top 25 Big East team. I think that's uh, that's solid. I will say for uh, the draft analysts out there, I think he was the head coach of like a, a world games team. Hey, he wasn't coaching the NBA. Big boys is the head coach, although he has been the assistant of like that Olympic national team. But like his credentials are absurd. Yeah. So I think he was he was one that was a legitimate first option for me. And then I ended up going with Mark Few just because I, I feel like we got a shot to make some things happen there. Jay Wright also has the two national titles. Yes. Which is he does have that over Mark Few, and that's the one thing that's that's off Few's resume is he does not have a national title. Which you could argue uh Jay Wright has that because he's playing in a tougher conference. And you know, they're battle tested, he gets, Jack. He gets battle tested every year in the Big East. You just don't get that in a four bid WCC league. It's also I we can talk about bad WCC takes later. All right. BCIT. Third pick, you're on the clock. Third pick. This one, I do think I, I go Tony Bennett here. So really? I that, I, yeah. I think the age factors in quite a bit for me. I won't lie to you there. But he's 52. He has a national title. 
I think the thing for me is that like I'm starting a program. What I like with Tony Bennett is that he can kind of develop the guys is where he might not be getting stars, but like they're going to get a lot out of them, which I think is why UVA fans say he's, you know, quote unquote, the best coach in the country. I also think he's one that like represents the program well, which we want to factor that in. That's another big one and kind of where Jay Wright's up there too. It wasn't, wasn't necessarily a lock for me in this spot. I just feel like he's one that's going to develop them and you can take him pretty much anywhere. And I think he would find a way to have success with those teams. And you start to look at like some of the things he's done um, is unbelievable. Like I don't, I think they finished top four in the ACC and it's like every year or top five in the ACC every year um, since 2011, 12, which is like super impressive. You know, they've had great teams. Uh, they do have the loss to a 16 seed, which I don't think you can ignore. Like some of their, their NCAA tournament appearances have been, you know, super uh, underwhelming where they lost that one. They had an elite eight where they were kind of beaten up on Syracuse and choked late in the game because they couldn't handle a press, didn't make the final four, but then to, to come back after losing to UMBC the next year and win a national title helps his resume and, and all that good stuff a lot. Also his recruiting has gotten better. I think now that he's proven himself a little bit and, gotten to the national title level where like they got a Trey Murphy as a transfer who became uh, an NBA draft pick their class next year is loaded at Virginia so I think he makes a lot of sense there and is one that like if you're the athletic director at a new program and you hire Tony Bennett you can go to sleep pretty easily knowing that like we're gonna get better and like the fans are gonna love him because he's just nice and good at coaching so that was kind of the the logic with that one I really like that. Fun fact, just a little peek behind the curtain. Tony Bennett wasn't even on my top 10. He wasn't even on my favorite. Really? Yeah. Wow. Um, fourth pick, F you on the clock. Yep. You ready for this one? This might be a little bit of a uh, boat rocker. Okay. We're going Tommy Lloyd. Arizona. <laughs> Bro, get out of here. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Is this his first year as a head coach? Okay, no, it's not. Maybe he'll be my next one. Your reaction changed my mind. <laughs> That's not how drafts work. You They're can... taking back the card. <laughs> no, and we're switching. What? Okay, I'll keep it to Tommy Lloyd. I'll got, keep it Tommy Lloyd. He's brand new at Arizona, first year. I don't know. I, I like what he's done. I think Arizona's a real solid team. Um, they, it's probably a prisoner of the moment pick. Um, you know what it is? <laughs> He really impressed me at the combine. He's a combine warrior. <laughs> and so I, I just really got locked in on him. Maybe I'm reaching a little bit because he probably wasn't even on your top 10. But yeah, this was, uh, <laughs> but was the big thing, he's 47, comes from Gonzaga. He was a Gonzaga longtime assistant under Mark Few. So it's kind of like you're taking Mark Few if you really uh, <laughs> squint one eye and stand on your head and really look at it that way. But what he's done with Arizona – they're a top tempo team with one of the most efficient offenses and one of the most efficient defenses. Yeah, they might be doing it with Sean Miller's recruits and everything, but I think what he's he's laying a really good foundation, and I think he's going to take Arizona to to where it needs to be. And I'm going to steal him with FU um, before he can get that going. Yeah, he is. Uh, he's a great coach, and I think he was he was like the coach in waiting essentially, right? They were going to give him. I think he had an actual contractual obligation or. Con a contract yeah. that was like guaranteeing he would be the, the gun second head coach. So he's got really good credentials as an assistant. Only the way he's even finished his first year as head coach is why I'm surprised why he took him this early. But given his age and, and what he's done so far, it's I think that's, hard. I think that's the main thing, his age. He's 47. Like you lock him in and you have him for 20 years. I think that's fair. I think that's, uh, that's not a bad pick. Surprise me. It's a surprising pick. It's a surprising pick. I, definitely... I think that's to take – I think that's one that could age well. I think you look at uh, a few years down the line, I think he might be considered a top-tier coach for sure. Appreciate it. All right. Number five pick, BCIT, who only teaches journalism. Yeah. You're on the clock. We're sticking with the class. We're sticking with the classiest guys in college basketball. We're taking Scott Drew. Wow. Scott, Another Scott Drew. Wow. <laughs> he's got a national title to his name. He turned around. When he took over Baylor, they were in, like, sanctions. and. Yes. So all these horrible things going on there on probation and all this stuff. It was a, a program that was in shambles, so to speak. Took him about four years. Then in the fifth year, he got him going. He's had them really good since. They've missed the tournament a couple of times. 
some NIT appearances, including an NIT championship, but they also have a pair of elite eights, a pair of sweet 16s. So I guess they have three of those because you got to count the national championship season checks the boxes for all those too. Um, but that was his only final four. That was his first final four with Baylor. But even with that, they've been really consistent under him. They've been successful. I was impressed and still am impressed, even though they've gotten blown out by Kansas recently. About how good they still were this year and still are this year. They're still yeah. a solid team, and I think they got a chance to, to win some tournament games. So I think they're built to last. I like the fact that he's you know widely respected as a coach in person. Uh, I think he makes a lot of sense as someone to add. And he's just been doing it way longer than I think people might realize where like he took over Valparaiso in 2002, led them to the NIT. Like that's 20 ish years as a head coach. I don't think you can put a price on that experience, especially, you know, the team you're going up against just drafted Tommy Lloyd who doesn't have that head coaching experience. No, but I, I do think his experiences puts him up there. And the, the fact that he's 51, like we talk a little bit about coach K and like Roy Williams retired and, and maybe the changing of the guard a little bit with the top coaches People talk about in the ACC a lot, but I think nationally too, like I think Tony Bennett and Scott Drew are going to be around having really good teams for a really long time. So that was kind of the logic and I'm pretty happy with those three guys. I like it. All right. My sixth pick for FU where they're on the clock for the sixth pick. I was going to go him. I was going to take this guy at four. Okay. But I jumped the gun with Tommy Lloyd. I'm going <laughs> Bill Self. I'm going Bill Self. That's a good one. to me. Slid to me at six. You, you can't you can't blink on him again. You can't let him potentially fall to eight because um, he might not be there at eight. So you, you take him at six where he is. He's 59. We all know head coach of Kansas, nearly unbeatable at Allen Fieldhouse, nearly unbeatable overall, one of the best teams in the country. I don't think Kansas ever has dipped below 27th in Kempom. My worry kind of with Bill Self is he inherited a really good Kansas program. He inherited a really good Illinois program. And the only time he's ever really had to build a team was in 1998 when he took over for Tulsa. They were 98th in Ken Palm. And then he built them into seventh nationally, which is fantastic. They got to the Elite Eight. And everywhere he goes, he hasn't missed the NCAA tournament um, from 2019 to 1999. He had never missed the NCAA tournament. 2020 they made it 2021 they made it as well it's good coach well i guess sorry it messed me up there 2020 there was uh covid so no one made the tournament but hasn't missed the tournament since they were um maybe the national title favorite that year though like they were really really good yeah so sorry about that mistake i was i was quickly looking at ken palm about that no but they were they were absolutely an elite team even though they don't get credit for what probably you know, could have been a legit run. I'd argue Dayton was probably the national title favorite. You know, ain't that would have been sweet. Be topping, but watching those Dayton. guys square off in the national championship would have been a lot of fun. Yeah, just a, a really good team. That year. Bill Self's a good one. He's had some some really successful teams, and I feel like people credit a lot of it sometimes is just like being Kansas. But he's a pretty good coach. Can recruit. And, it's uh, yeah. It's weird people credit because I I agree. I think a lot of people credit, oh, it's Kansas. It could coach itself. You just said, right. said Kansas off of, you know, brand alone. But people don't really do that with Coach K or they didn't really do it with Roy Williams at UNC. And I'd argue that those brands too could coach themselves. Yeah, I think Coach K should get more credit because he, he kind of built that brand. Um, yeah. Whereas Roy Williams maybe inherited a, a UNC that was a little more legit. But, but yeah, I mean, once you get to a certain point and some of it's like the same with like Mark few, once you get to a certain point, like you're reeling in studs yeah. constantly and they know you're a good and like you have a baseline level of coaching. Like it yeah. seems reasonable to kind of hang in there. And that's kind of what's interesting about Duke a little bit. Not that that really matters, but they've had some years where like they've kind of floundered up and down. Um, like last year, they stunk. Didn't make the tournament last year. They were not a very good team. They've kind of come back this year, but they've had, they've had some ebbs and flows. All right. Seventh pick, BCIT, you're on the clock. Yeah, some good options. Some really good options here. I go back and forth. This is a tough one. I think I'm just going to take John Calipari. Woo! Because he can build teams, build programs. The thing, the thing is, we might have some wins vacated, right? There might <laughs> be some, some quote-unquote – NCAA violations <laughs> that we have. And uh, he's had some of those during his career. That's for sure. 
But other than that, you feel pretty few. good about it, man. He wins a lot. And obviously last year was kind of a weird year where they really sucked. But, like, he's recruits better than pretty much anybody. He's won in a lot of places, which is probably because he was handing out a bag. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't care. Yeah, how do you get Derrick Rose to Memphis? We already – yeah, exactly. We already have uh, Tony Bennett and Scott Drew, the classiest of class. I might as well add Calipari, right? So I think he, uh, he's got cool. one national title. That's kind of the one thing you point to with him too, is like a lot of winning with like a lot of, not a lot of national titles given the talent level. But if you can have someone who's bringing in a bunch of five stars, like chances are more often than not, your team's going to make the tournament and like go to a sweet 16 or whatever. So I'm pretty happy with that. I think Calipari is one that if you're starting a program, he's 62 years old, it makes a lot of sense just because from, I think if the criteria was like, I want you to win a national championship in a new program in like three years, he might be my first guy because I think he's going to land a bunch of recruits and find a way to get you close to that. Yeah. I think that's a really good pick. Thanks, man. I wouldn't have gone there, but I think that's a good pick. For the eighth pick, FU is taking Bruce Pearl. Yeah, that's a good one. Thank you. So in 2019, he takes Auburn to the Final Four. In 2020, Maybe had another Final Four in him, but had a, a couple tournament wins, but COVID stops it. And then last year's a little bit of a down year, 13 and 14 in the SEC, not great. And then just bursts onto the scene this year, r- rattles off that huge winning streak. Um, they just lost last night. We're recording on Wednesday last night to Arkansas in overtime in a fantastic game. But Auburn is a darn good basketball team. And not to mention what Bruce Pearl did at Tennessee, taking him to the Sweet 16 twice, taking him to the Elite Eight once, getting them all the way up to 13th nationally in Ken Palm, and then built a little bit of something from 2002 to 2005 at Milwaukee. Um, Overall, I just think he's a really good coach. He might not be, you know, he's not your Calipari. He's not your Mark Few. He's not necessarily going to have you in the top 10 every single year, year in and year out. But I think he's going to build a really, really good culture. He's going to get the really good guys. He doesn't deal with those one and dones. You know, that's ruining college basketball. He's bringing in guys who buy into the program. They're going to redshirt their first year. You know what I'm saying? And they're going to stay there like Jabari Smith, though, right? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm talking. Yeah, except <laughs> it's fine, whatever. <laughs> no, but he's I, I think Bruce Pearl's a really good culture builder. He's, mm-hmm. he's not necessarily going to – get you, you know, he's not going to get you two losses in a year. He's going to, there's going to be a couple blemishes. There might be a couple of down years where the recruiting didn't go as well, but Auburn just handed him a lifetime contract for a reason. He's built up two really good SEC programs in Tennessee and Auburn built up Milwaukee to get it to the sweet 16 in 2005. Give me Bruce Pearl at eight. It's a good pick. It's a good pick. This is a tough one here for my fifth and final pick. Part of me really wanted to take kind of an older guy with a Patino or an Izzo because Rick Patino like showed that he can go to Iona and have them be like a real fun team immediately. Another one where like we might vacate some wins, there might be some shady activity on campus, but Rick didn't know about it, right? Oh, Look at all the assistants. Yeah, it's just the assistants who are meddling in his life. Um, so that was one that that did stand out. He is sixty nine though, so you're probably getting like I don't know five years or something, maybe more of that. We'll see how long he, he ends up wanting to go. Uh, the pick though that I'm going to finish off with is Chris Beard. I'm a big Chris Beard guy. Ooh, We've great talked... pick. Thanks, Great man. pick. We... I, that's... <laughs> We've talked before about how different things could be uh, if they, Texas Tech had beaten Virginia in the national championship. Chris Beard would already have a national title. But he's the thing for me is, like, he's 48 and he's won everywhere. Like, he had success during a one-season stint with um, – it was McMurray. They're called McMurray Warhawks. And the NCCAA, uh, I don't know if it's community college. I've got to double check on exactly what that that is. I don't know. This is this is this is um. I can put Beard, Chris Beard. I think it's community college. Yeah, this is Chris Beard. But anyway, he was there. Then he goes Division Two uh, with Angelo State. His final year, he's only only there for two years. They're twenty eight and six. Then he goes to Arkansas Little Rock. For one year, they go 30 and five, win an NCAA tournament game, 17 and three in the Sun Belt. And then he's only there for one year before Texas Tech snags the guy. Uh, they've had a winning record every year. They were Elite Eight, 2017 18. Then they lost to Virginia in overtime, the national championship in 2018 19. 
the next year they were kind of bubble-ish, I guess you could say, uh, when the tournament was canceled. Then they made the round of 32 last year, Mac McClung and company. Now he's at Texas. Uh, they're pretty solid this year. I mean, they're not, I don't, I wouldn't say Texas is a national title contender, but he added a bunch of really talented transfers. They have a lot of talent, just got a home win over Kansas. They have beaten Tennessee at home, but they got a, a good group of wins kind of forming together here. Their losses have been reasonably competitive. So I like what he's done. I like that he's young. I like his energy. I like they play really good defense at a consistent level. I think maybe more importantly than anything, like he's won at so many different levels with different programs and can recruit feels like a, a guy that maybe I should have even taken earlier given his age and, and success. But yeah, I think he's one of the best coaches in college basketball. I think it's only a matter of time until he cuts down the net, cuts down the nets with someone. We'll see how long he stays in Texas or if he wants to maybe move somewhere else eventually. That's a fantastic pick. Like I'm mad at myself for not thinking about him. Can't believe he slipped all the way down to nine. Yeah, kind of wild given his his track record at multiple places. And with the 10th pick, FU has a lot of options on the board still, you know, and yeah. no one's and and this is it. So do I take do I take someone, you know, that's proven, that's kind of a blue blood coach that, you know, people might know about or do I go the young up and coming coach that's that's had a few really good seasons at maybe a smaller school that I just want to shine a spotlight on him, you know? Okay. Who, which way am I going? Which way? Which way? With the 10th pick, I'm going Todd Golden. I kind of like this one. 36 years old, San Francisco head coach for the last three seasons. In 2019, he got his Dons. Yeah, got mm-hmm. his Dons. I always mix them up with the – fun fact, he played at St. Mary's as a guard. so. That's where I get the Dons and Gales mixed up. That, that's why it always happens. Exactly. But with San Francisco, took him in his first year in 2020, a tough coat. Well, I guess COVID hadn't really hit yet, but bad finish. Took him to be 22-12, and 12, got all the way up to 74th in Ken Palm. Last year in 2021, a little bit of a back step, 11-14, and 14, 93rd in Ken Palm. But then this year, they're sitting at 19-6, and 6, 40th in Ken Palm. They're looking like a really, really good WCC school. They have wins over Davidson, UAB, Fresno State, wins over Santa Clara, BYU, a bad loss to Portland um, off of a back-to-back and away in a home game, one-point loss in the the second of that back-to-back to Portland. So we won't even discuss that. But Todd Golden, before he gets to San Francisco, he's on Bruce Pearl's staff, so you see a little bit of that connection there. Mm -hmm. Um, And then he also played – the played in Israel, a lot of good stuff. So he knows what he's doing on the basketball court in case you want to, you know, an ex player, he's a kind of that player's coach. And then before he was elevated to head coach at San Francisco, he was an assistant working with their defensive, you kind of like the defensive specialist, the defensive coach, the defensive coordinator. And during that time, San Francisco had one of the best nationally ranked defenses. So I like what he's doing. 36 years old, so, so young. One of the youngest coaches in Division I college basketball. Could I have gone somewhere else and probably had a little bit more of a resume, a little bit more of a proven track record? Yeah, I could have. But I think this is a fun one. Todd Golden, San Francisco, 36 years old. Tenth pick. Give it to me. I think I think he can do a really good job at building a program while also building up his resume. Yeah. Um, 11 and 14 last year, but one of those 11 wins was a win over Virginia. I remember that one. That one well. Really good coach. Young. Interesting pick, but I, I one that I, I like. Should we highlight the uh, the teams of five? Yeah. All right. My boys. I got uh, I've got Mark Few, Tony Bennett, Scott Drew. And then I added John Calipari and Chris Beard. I got uh, Jay Wright, Tommy Lloyd. Tommy Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> the young guns. Bill Self, Bruce Pearl, Todd Golden. I like it. It's a fun group. It is. It's a young group. I went a little bit younger. That was my that was my strategy. And thus concludes the. Tw- Are there any uh, any honorable mentions that you had that you were maybe considering that were close? Yes, for the tenth pick, I almost went Travis Steele from Xavier. Really? 
Interesting. Yeah. I uh, I had Patino and Izzo mention them. Mick Cronin is one that I think is sneaky, sneaky good. He's only 50. Yeah. Had some success at Cincinnati and uh, UCLA looks pretty good. Matt Painter was another one that was like, all right, maybe, maybe he's 51. And then the one that I thought would be funny, but didn't want to do because we were you know, taking it seriously was Will Wade. Will Wade's a gangster. He's no, had he's success not. at I multiple can't. spots. The issue is that's like you're getting violations and you're like maybe making the round of 32 with your violations. <laughs> You're getting violations with the FBI. I mean, <laughs> it's not like NCAA violations. It's FBI wiretaps. So I thought that was an interesting one. And then if you're looking older, you can even look at like a Rick Barnes. He's had a ton of, ton of success over there. I was thinking years. of Rick Barnes. See, my thoughts were like, either I have him for 10 years. Yeah. Like a 60-year-old coach, which is the reason I went, you know, right, Pearl, self. Sure. And then my other thinking was, I can have him for 40 years. So let me go ultra young. And the other one, the other one uh, that I thought would have been interesting that did not do was Porter Moser. Yeah, good coach. Really I, good I just coach. haven't seen. I say this, I haven't seen enough as I pick Tommy Lloyd. I haven't seen enough of him at, at Oklahoma. Yeah, I guess you might want to see more there. But Bill Loyal of Chicago, he's been coaching as a head coach for a long, long time. Been around the business, you know. So I thought he was an interesting one. I was trying to think if there are any others that that popped up. I think those are the main guy but uh yeah i like some of those picks i like some yeah. of those uh some of those guys but you didn't even go with like uh like a nico medved med what is it medved oh medved from colorado state yeah i thought he might be in the mix for you you're a big you mountain west med guy med, yeah. i thought you might go mountain west instead of wcc at some point no i'm going wcc baby we had a couple so we, what do we have two wcc guys that with with uh mark few and todd golden Two WCCs, a Big East, um, a, an ACC. Two, no, yeah, ACC, a lot of SEC. That's interesting. The Did other we, obvious obvious pick would have been Josh Pastner, but uh, I passed on that this time around. All right. Just for the and, quotes. <laughs> <laughs> and thus concludes the 2022 College Basketball Coach Draft hosted by the DRF College Sports Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. All right, you want to get to real picks here as we're at the 40 minute mark on this podcast? Maybe, yeah, maybe we can we can picks. grind through these. Yeah, all right, we'll hit these quick. Thursday, we got a couple games as I'm clicking around trying to figure this out. A couple games on Thursday, Purdue at Michigan is the highlight of them all. Purdue heads on the road, five point favorite against a struggling, struggling Michigan team. Uh, they were a top 10 team, I believe, preseason, and they've just fallen by the wayside. Juwan Howard, what's happening in Ann Arbor? A, in their defense, they've been a little bit more competitive recently. Okay. So who do you got, Purdue or Michigan? Part of me part of me really likes Michigan in this spot. Really? It's a, it, yeah, it's a home game for them. Purdue's smoking people, right? They look great. Michigan, they've won five of their last seven. Two losses were on the road. They have a road win over Indiana during that time. I think Indiana might have had some – uh, personnel problems but they only lost by six to purdue on the road last uh saturday february 5th so about a week ago a little less than a week actually i am tempted to take them if the spread's only like plus five or something at home i think i might yeah. take them i don't right. know that they are good enough to like fight their way back on the bubble because they're 12 and 9 but i don't, I don't know it's if there's a conference where you could have a, a affordable record and, and get in all right big ten definitely yeah. one of those I, uh, I like your reasoning there. I'd go Purdue. I think just based off of what you said, they're beating people up. They're looking good. I think they're one of the best teams in the country with Jaden Ivey, Travion Williams, Zach Eady. We say this every podcast. You can't guard big. Um, I, think, I think they win. Next up, let's go Duke at Clemson. You were high on Clemson. No, you were high on UNC to cover against Clemson. However, UNC did do that. They won by two. Yeah. yeah. That was yesterday, right? Yeah. In my yeah. mind, Clemson was up for, up like 15 at one point. And... Thought it was a good bounce back spot for the Tar Heels, who eventually did bounce back. Kind of think it's a good bounce back spot for Duke. Uh, oh, one hundred percent it is. Look at the way they played after conference losses. So they lost to Miami at home, went on the road, beat Wake Forest, which is one of the better teams in the ACC this year. Beat them by 12 on the road. Lost to Florida State in overtime. Came home, beat Syracuse by 20. So. If you get a spread of five, I don't care that it's on the road. Coming off a game they probably should have won against Virginia where they didn't play well. I think they get back in the win column, and then they have matchups 
uh, with BC, Wake, and Florida State with two of those three at home. I think they can kind of solidify themselves atop the ACC. I'm saying this as someone that holds a Duke ACC future. Uh, they're tied with Notre Dame, who's due to due to take some losses here. So uh, I like the spot for um, for uh, for Duke, and then I think I might look at Clemson on Saturday, home against Notre Dame. Yeah, I think Duke here's the play too. At five points, I think they're a lot better of a team than Clemson. Bounce back spot. I also think Duke is still a national title contender. Like I think they're oh, yeah. sneaky to to put some stuff together and and go on a run in in March. I just think they're also very capable of losing to lesser opponents. I don't know what it is, but like watching it yesterday, Bancaro didn't jump off the screen, and like Wendell Moore was missing shots, and Williams wasn't do- like. It just seems like sometimes they kind of play down to their opponent. And it was probably because it was such a letdown spot. You're coming off of a huge win against UNC. The crowd's fired up. You're still at home. There wasn't a lot like – it was just a classic letdown spot. So that might have been it. But I still think Duke is one of the six, seven best teams in the country. I think that's a fair take. You want to go to Friday or you want to pick another Thursday game? What are your, what are your vibes? I don't love Thursday. the Thursday games. Yeah. I mean – Part of me wants to take like Maryland to, to cover against Iowa at home, but it's it's hard to trust that team. But they have had a couple like reasonable home performances yeah. recently, and I don't love Iowa. Like there's been a couple times where I was like, oh yeah, I think I will will make some stuff happen. Like they're a tournament team, but other than that, they're just kind of underwhelming. They also like are weird. They started seven and zero, and then they just lost three games. They kind of suck on the road. Yeah. <laughs> so I think. I might throw in like a Maryland money line, even though that's a stupid play. That that probably won't be a best bet because Maryland, but. Maybe Fats Russell though. All right. So moving to Friday, not a lot, but I do really like Friday's slate because there's a really good Big East, really good Mountain West, few good Mountain West, and a really good A-10. So with that being said, let's dive into the Big East. UConn at Xavier. Xavier, the home team. They're two-point favorites. This is on FS1 at 7 p.m. I think that I think this line may be subject to change a little bit. I Xavier plays yeah, tonight, so I can see on how you wrote about that one, right? I did. I I I don't have a winning record right now against the spread, but if you look at my money, I do. I I like money line underdogs. If you look at that, I think I have a winning record when I pick money line underdogs. Um, so I, I, I think Xavier wins tonight against Seton Hall on the road in Newark, New Jersey. But Yeah, that might affect how I would play the Friday game. I would lean uh, with, with Xavier and what they're doing, um, especially with, with Connecticut having that, that nice win over Marquette. Maybe it's a, a spot where you can get Xavier. But Connecticut's legit. I love them Tuesday over Marquette. I thought that was a, a great bounce back for them, and they got it. Uh, they're a really good team. They play pretty well. When they do lose, it's really close. So I, I like them. In that spot, I think I might have liked them over Villanova on Saturday. I can't remember. I don't think that was the best bet, but I'll probably end up staying away. Maybe see what happens with this Wednesday one. But a couple of good teams that will be in the tournament. Yeah, I think it'll be a really good Big East game. Um, I'll be tuned in. Three and three. UConn's three and three away um, from home. So that might have a little bit of a play in it, too, that I think Xavier defends home court fairly well, only – uh, maybe home. not. They have three home losses, but still. They? It, what was that? Do they really? Yeah, they have three home losses. Wow. Uh, but in, in college basketball, like home court, maybe it, not even just the fact that it's a raucous environment, but like everything that goes into travel when it comes to a college team is huge. So I, I think I might like Xavier. But, I, but yeah, wait to do this game. I guess you will be because this comes out on Thursday, so disregard me. Fresno State at Colorado State. I think you know who I like in this one, but who do you like? This one's kind of tough for me. Colorado State, watch them play a little bit uh, on Friday. I didn't watch the whole game. I guess they'll only beat San Diego State by a point. They were kind of smoking them there for a little while um, in an ugly scoring game. But they've been really solid. They strike me as a team that I would like to see get in because – David Roddy is a freak. He's listed as 6'6", 255, but he also, like, can shoot, which I'm not really he's shooting 50% from three, 32 of 64. Like, he's he's a fascinating player. So you've got – this is a game that's probably worth watching. You've got two really great teams. 
um, with, with really great players, two really solid teams with great players. Orlando Robinson's really, really talented uh, for Fresno State. Ah, I go back and forth on this one. It's a, a hard one for me to pick. I, I Part of me would consider Fresno State just because they'll be the dog in this game, but might might look at, uh, I don't know, see what the line is. I, my guess is it's competitive, which is why I kind of lean the dog in some of those Mountain West games. Yeah. Here's the thing, though. Fort Collins, watching a lot of Mountain West games, Fort Collins is a place a four-leg parlay goes to die when you bet against Colorado State. They are pretty good at home. Like, they're good at home. It's a tough place to play. It's a tough place to go to. Um, Fresno State's the better team in this one, but I think Colorado State has the better player. And in the Mountain West, at Fort Collins – home for the Rams. Give me Nico Medved. Give me Roddy and the Rams. I'd consider the total. Maybe taking the under. I think this could be gross. Probably a low total to begin with, but I think for a fun play, taking the under would be would be fun. <laughs> Life's too short to bet the unders, bro. I don't care. <laughs> Quick A-10. This might be a best bet for me. Might not be because that spread might be big. St. Bonaventure in St. Louis. Kind of a shame to see what happened to the Bonnies this season. Kind of a dark horse national title contender. And now all of a sudden they're sitting at barely in the top 100 in Kempom. And they're like nine point dogs on the road this weekend against St. Louis. Yeah, they stink. They stink. So probably won't be a best bet because that's a huge line. But that is a pretty large number. I will, uh, I'll give you that. All right, Saturday. This is a fun day. UCLA at USC. I think I know who I like. Give me UCLA minus three on the road against USC. USC um, kind of up and down, it seems, at times. Who do you like? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I would lean uh, UCLA just because I think they're they're better. But I will say USC at home scares me a little bit. But my, my initial lean would be UCLA. Um, the loss, they've had three consecutive road games. This will be their fourth consecutive road game. Two of those were losses. Arizona, um, they were dealing with some personnel stuff before that. I think they got some guys back for that game. Still ended up losing by 10. I think the spread was like minus seven or whatever. We talked about that. that was um, and then a, a triple overtime loss to Arizona State on the road. But they back with a win at Stanford. I mean, I think they're better than USC. But at the same time, like it's you playing at USC, I think adds kind of a different element to it. Texas at Baylor. Baylor favored by six. Yeah, I would hammer Baylor here. I would too. They got smoked by uh, by Kansas last time out, but I, I like them in that spot. We'll see what happens Wednesday. Kind of think Kansas State, if they're only like a little favorite in that one, that could be a good play for you because you got a uh, got a Texas team that's coming into its own. But if the line is that big, I think Baylor is the play. And especially being home for Baylor. I think that's big. Yeah. If it was Baylor minus six at Texas, I mm-hmm. would say hammer Texas. But the fact it's at Waco, give me Baylor. Give me the Bears. This is fair. Arkansas at Alabama. I – you want to hear – this might be an upset pick. Yeah. I like Arkansas. Could it be a letdown spot big time for him coming off the Auburn win? Yeah. 100%. That's but am I just <laughs> – that's what scares me, but they have, what is it? They've won like eight in a row, including they just beat Auburn. Like they're looking really good. They're looking, I think earlier in the year, people were like, wow, you know, the must bust company, they didn't schedule hard. And now they're starting to struggle when they play some real teams, but, but they've really turned it on here late with some phenomenal play. And they look like a team that's, that's ready to go to the NCAA tournament with a little momentum. Yeah. I mean, maybe probably not taking Arkansas money line, but if it's Arkansas plus five plus six, I'll do it. Okay. Um, anything else Saturday before we get to best bets? Our uh, our long form draft went a little long, so I, I don't want to I don't want to go too far over an hour. I, if I can get Clemson, I hope Clemson gets blown out by Duke on Thursday. But if that happens and I get Clemson at home on Saturday as like a small favorite against a Notre Dame team that will have won like six of his last seven, that strikes me as a fishy line. So I'm hoping that happens. We'll see if it does. Then I think Clemson over Notre Dame on Saturday would be one that I would definitely play. I kind of want to pull on pull on some of my uh, my JMU knowledge here. I kind of think I kind of think I like them Thursday. It's a Thursday game, 
but against Elon, I don't know. They're due for a win. Then they do play William and Mary at home on Saturday. That's one. I, would, I don't know. Maybe you look at the, the total or something because William and Mary stinks, but I think JMU is an interesting team that I'll, I'll take a look at at some point this week. Cause I think there's, there's some reason to want to take them and uh, Chattanooga Furman Saturday game. One of the best games of the weekend, in my opinion, both these teams are really good. I don't know who's going to end up getting in the tournament from that league. My guess is it's one of those two from the Southern conference. Both of them are dangerous. The game is at Furman. Looks like Chattanooga is going to be a short dog. Um, if, if Furman's favored in that game, Furman lost two in a row, but I still think they're really good close losses at home in a big game. Chattanooga needed a buzzer beater. I don't know if you saw it, but a buzzer beater on Monday to beat Mercer. I did see it. Uh, it was a Monday game. Saw that clip. I love the Chattanooga boys. You know that. So if we get to March Madness, I'm taking Chattanooga probably blindly. But uh, I think Furman on Saturday is one of my one of my plays. Awesome. Yeah. All right. You ready for best bets? Yeah, I am. How many are you doing today? Here's the thing. I've been doing a lot recently. You know that. And yeah. I think maybe maybe that's been a little scary. Maybe that hasn't been the best decision for me to do so many bets. But let's do Michigan. Michigan plus five or whatever it is on Thursday, right? So tonight, got it. Yep. Then you look, and Arizona-Washington State is a fascinating matchup. A Thursday? Fascinating. This is Thursday. Okay. I think. It is. You're right. Yeah. That was on me. That's, no, 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 no. That's a fascinating game. God, consider, consider Washington State, but it, it scares me a little bit. So we'll take Duke. If they're only minus five, that's like borderline fish. But I'll take, like with Clemson, but I'll take uh, Duke, whatever the heck that spread is, don't care. So Duke spread, uh, Michigan spread, those will be. And then kind of a lame one here because they're going to – now let's go Let's go bold. JMU spread against Elon. Really? I'm not going to hand you like a minus 300 money line winner. That's a joke just to improve my record. They have been disappointed with them, but they've been venting their frustration and talking about how the, everything in the world is against them. I think they'll maybe start to rally slowly around the fact that they can get going. Charles Falden playing, that would be huge. But they're at home. They lost to Elon by 23 the first time. I think there's going to be a sense of pride and like, hey, that can't happen again. You're also looking at an Elon team that I think is just not good, especially on the road. They absolutely suck on the road. Like they're a joke on the road. So JMU, give me that one. I think that's a, a solid play on Thursday. And uh, all right, so those are, what is that, three? You're at three. I'm at three. I like Connecticut Xavier scares me a little bit. Fresno State scares me a little bit. Friday, I'm considering playing nothing. That's normally your, your vibe. Because Fridays are, are just <laughs> sad, you know, but um, that's not what the people want. That's not what the people are clamoring for. <laughs> they they want to see something. They, wanna, they, they are hungry for winners. But I just don't know that I have one on Friday. First. All right. It's, All right. That's fine. Let's go to Saturday. I'm not going to. We don't have one. to overextend ourselves I'm by not gonna any force one. <laughs> I'm not going to force one, even though I do that literally all the time. Okay. Friday, a little scared of the Baylor one because I feel like does Baylor get right against Kansas State? Saturday. On the, what did I say? Friday. Yeah. Okay. Well, they play Kansas State on. Uh, on Wednesday, they play Texas on Saturday. You're correct, but I'm I'm worried that in that Wednesday game they're going to get right, and then it's like, is there even the right value? But I still think it's it's the right place. So I'm going to take uh, Baylor on Saturday at home against Texas. I'm going to take Ohio State money line. I know take the, no, that one's gone. Don't do that one. Don't do that one, folks. <laughs> Just give me the uh, give me Baylor and give me Alabama. Alabama to cover against Arkansas at home. Right. And my last one, Clemson spread Saturday at home against Notre Dame. All right. I thought that's six. I like that. I like that. Is that six? One, two, three, four, five, six. That's not good because you never want to end with an even number. Are you ready for mine? Yeah, go ahead. Wait, wait, wait. And I want Furman. Furman's my seventh, folks. Furman, I want to make that clear. Furman spread um, against Chattanooga as well. All right. Okay. I like it. Furman spread. So we got, <laughs> uh, I, yeah. 
You ready for my three, <laughs> Mr. That's, Seven? Yeah, then we'll recap our 10, I guess. All right, I love on Saturday, VCU will might be a dog against Mason. Yeah, but the at Mason, hey, Mason's a scrappy bunch. Mason's a scrappy bunch. I think VCU's faded a little bit, but I still think they're a good team. Offensively, they're one of the worst teams in the country. Not good at all. They've put up 52 in a loss to Dayton, then they beat Duquesne in Rhode Island. Um, but the offense just leaves a lot to be desired. But they're one of the best defenses in the country. I think they can beat George Mason. And if you can get them on the money line, it plus value. I'm hammering the Rams all day, every day, twice on Saturday. Then also on Saturday, we're going to keep it in the A-10. I've been a little bit red hot in the A-10. Maybe I'm getting a big head when it comes to this. Give me Davidson. They're right now only favored by two over Rhode Island. Are you serious? Davidson minus two against Rhode Island? Hammer it. Hammer it. Hammer it. Give me Bob McCrew. <laughs> I take it that's a road game? Uh, it is a road game, yeah. You love these A-10 road teams, it appears. And then Friday, we're backtracking a little bit. We're going a Mountain West game. We're going Mountain West. I was thinking maybe we go a little UNLV at Boise State action. Maybe we go Nevada at Utah State. No. We talked about it earlier. I'm going Colorado State at home against Fresno State. Fresno cannot go into Fort Collins and take down Roddy and the Rams. Give me like the Rams and Nico Medved and the point. So spread there. I dig that. I want to do a quick look ahead to Monday. You got Virginia playing at Virginia Tech. So the Cavaliers play Georgia Tech at home on Saturday. I think they can win that one. It'll be four in a row, including a very national prominent win at Duke. Then they're going to Virginia Tech for a nationally televised game. Hokies have quietly won four in a row, and they play Syracuse on Saturday. Their wins are not as impressive as a Duke win. Uh, but if they're at home, it looks like Ken Palm's got them as a six-point favorite. If I can get Virginia Tech as like a four-and-a-half-point favorite against a Virginia team that is playing well, and I think the public will love, I love, 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 love Virginia Tech on Monday. Not a best bet because it's a little too far out, um, but that's one that I think would be a, a really good one to keep an eye on for Monday. Love it. So where can people find you and uh, all your, your betting writing and your betting talking? Oh, yeah. Well, I actually tweeted out my picks this week, which I thought was a big improvement for me. And um, you can find me at Bennett Conlin, B-E-N-N-E-T-T, -T, and then C-O-N-L-I-N for the last name. Should be tweeting out most of my stuff there. So you can find articles, all that good stuff. Jack, my good friend in the state of North Carolina. Some positive vibes today from... Uh, from some reports of sports betting, mobile sports betting, that is, being legalized in your state, looking like that could have some traction in mid-May when the legislature reconvenes. Although they are currently still in 2021 session, but it sounds like they're just focused on redistricting right now, and then the sports <laughs> betting bill could be discussed uh, in May. So keep an eye out for that, folks. I love that. That is music oh, yeah. to my ears. Um, and speaking of sports books, if you're in Iowa and you're listening, Go ahead and download the DRF Sportsbook app. You can also check us out at ia.drf.com um, for all your sportsbook betting needs. Absolutely phenomenal stuff. The, uh, we actually have a prop bet, and I'm, I'm, I'm upset I can't bet it because I'm not in Iowa. Prop bet on the website, on the sportsbook. Will the game end in Scorigami? Yes, plus 1,400, I believe it is, and uh, no is minus 5,000. I think I'd, wow. I'd put a dollar on yes, just to have some fun with it. With all that being said, you can find us, all of the good stuff happening at DRF underscore sports on Twitter and at DRF sports on Instagram. You can also find our home on the web, DRF.com slash sports. All the betting content, all the podcasts, all the videos, everything can be found there and also on our YouTube. So go ahead and check us out. Thank you guys for tuning into the DRF College Sports Podcast. A reminder that I'm 20 and 10 on my best bet, so you might want to tail me and fade Bennett over there. Have a wonderful rest of your day. See you next Thursday. See ya. Thanks for listening to the DRF College Sports Podcast. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show. 
For more sports betting advice, go to drf.com backslash sports, and you can follow DRF Sports on Twitter at DRF underscore sports.